Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. A church that does, does not exist to reclaim heathenism, to fight evil, to destroy error, to put down falsehood, a church that does not exist to take the side of the poor, to denounce injustice, and to hold up righteousness is a church that has no right to be. Not for yourself, O oh church, do you exist any more than Christ existed for himself. Charles Spurgeon tells us that there's two dimensions when we gather to worship. One is obviously to praise. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, which we just desperate for in song, reminds us that we are here to praise our God. We're also here to be equipped and to be trained to live our lives in the world in which God has placed us. And sometimes that means to fight injustice, to help the poor, to uphold righteousness. And that's why we've gathered, so that through the Word of God and through mutual interaction, we can train and equip each other for that task. Welcome to you in the name of Christ. Let's bow before our great Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow with me. Pray with me. Don't listen to me. Pray with me. May these words, your own, and then at the end, give this confident affirmation with a hearty amen. Father, we agree with what Paul has written and want to do what he exhorted us to do. And that's to praise you, to bless your name for the untold blessings given to us by your calling, choosing us, predestining us, redeeming us, and sealing us for the day of redemption. A Trinitarian operation to redeem us sinners. We worship, we praise you. But we're not simply prepared to praise you. Much more is involved in being a follower of Jesus. And so I, I ask you, Spirit of God, you who sealed us, now to sanctify us, and train us, and encourage us for the journey that lies ahead of us this afternoon, at the Brit Academy, as well as throughout the week, arm each one, young and old, male and female, for the challenge of being a Christian in the 21st century. We devote our service to those ends and pray these things with confidence because we come through Christ our Lord. Let's worship. Yeah. No, big thanks to Phoebe and Chloe and to Janae and Beth and family. Yeah. And some uh, thank you is also. Um, in order. I think we're going to get the lights there in just a minute. Uh, but um, a big thanks to Justin, who was on the box this morning. Our, our drummer is in quarantine today. And a big thanks to Brad Prince, who drove all the way from Pillsborough County to be our bass guitarist, because our bass guitarist is also under quarantine. So would you put your hands together and say thank you to Brad and to Justin and to the Benson family. Yeah, do we have control over the lights here? No, I mean the lights are over here. Yeah, can you guys see your Bibles? That's the point. Yeah. You're okay? All right, I know. It used to be we were in a cave in here, but they changed out the lights, I think. And I think you're much better. But I hope you can see your own Bible. That's one of the things that will help us to follow along this morning is for us to be able to actually read our phone or... The, the hard copy. How many of you still, let me see your hand, how many of you still use a hard copy of the Bible? Let me see that. Okay, okay, you are forgiven of all your sins for the rest of your life. All right. <laughs> what am I doing conferring sin or forgiveness of sins? Yeah, so uh, anyways, yeah, thank you to the Benton folks. You do a, a great, a great job and we appreciate it. All right, so uh, Big welcome to our visitors. If there are any of them, I can't really see your face very clearly, but a welcome to our family as well. Join me for a moment of prayer. Lord, you've given us an interest in your word. You've given us the gift of your word. It's written down so we can actually read it and study it. And we come together each week to examine it, to see what it is that you have said under inspiration to people of every generation. Your word has encouraged our forefathers, our great-grandparents, and generations before that. It's been a guide, it's been a way to reveal Christ, and it's been a way to sanctify us, 
under the cooperation of the Spirit, as well as we've got our pathway in parenting, marriage, being an employer, employee, a student, uh, many things covered in your word. And so we devote our time once again this morning to examine Jesus' words in Luke's Gospel. These are inspired words, and we are praying for the operation of your Spirit. I don't want to preach a message, Lord, just to give information, even to speak truth. We want, Lord, and ask for the power of your Spirit to energize the words and to make the rough places plain in our hearts, to reveal light in darkness, and to give hope where there is hopelessness and forgiveness where there is despair. And Lord, you have a thousand things to take care of in each one of our lives. Humbly, we open ourselves up to you and to say, Lord, we need your help. We need to hear the voice of God speaking to us, changing us, sanctifying us, drawing us closer to Christ and to one another, and to look out and see a lost and a dying world. So prepare us for those moments during these few minutes that we share together in your word, for Jesus' sake. Uh, recently I read of Tommy Lawrence, like a young kid born in the Victorian age. He loved stories of King Arthur and the Round Table. Maybe you did too. He was born in England and dreamed of being a knight, dreamed of uh, living in the Middle Ages or in medieval times with castles and knights. But one of his biggest dreams was before the age of 30 to be knighted. Knighted meant that the King of England, or the Queen of England, as was the case, would go through this little ceremony, read an oath, tap his shoulder with a sword while he knelt on this special stool, and be known forever after as a knight commander of the Order of the British Empire. Every young boy's dream. And after that, people would call you sir. Sir Winston Churchill. He was knighted. So he dreamed of that. And he was sent as a young man to the Middle East during the early part of the century as an envoy for the British Army. A perfect spot for him to prepare his journey of being knighted and being looked up to and being a hero. When Jesus noticed the people at the banquet or the feast in Luke 14, 1 through 6, a banquet that he was invited to by a prominent Pharisee, along with many other scribes or the legal experts of the day, as well as other Pharisees, he noticed a pattern, which is revealed in verse 7, I think. He noticed a pattern of the guests. And uh, the the ruling religious leaders of the day were keeping their eye on him, but he is keeping his eye on them. And he sees a pattern. He sees a pattern of religious people, a pattern which is still a problem even in this century, a pattern of people using their religion to parade their importance in front of other people, of showing up, of advertising their greatness, and advertising their importance. In the first century, meals and banquets were an opportunity to show your social status. And if you were high, you got to sit near the host. And the closer the host you were, the more important you were. So if you walked into a banquet hall, People watched where you sat, because where you sat determined how cool you were, how much money you made, how influential you were, how many awards you had, how many records you had sold, how many books you had sold. And then you could take your prominent place, visible to everybody else, and go, ah. and people would say, man, I want to be like him. Man, I want to be like him. One day I want to have his chair. I want to be cool. I want to be thought of. I want to be a hero. And that problem, of course, is very much alive and well today, where Christianity is used by celebrities, by musicians, to parade their importance, to parade their talents, and to parade their skills. And it, of course, seeps down into people, into people's lives, 
into marriages. It seeps into churches where people want to be known as important. And they need to be needed. They need to be heroes. They need to be admired and looked up to. And these are the same people that, you know, they have a hard time at home saying when they made a mistake, you know, I, I'm wrong. I was wrong to do that. That's my fault. Would you forgive me? Those are the same people who are basically like Spurgeon used to say, puffed up with a gas of self-importance, swelling up like a poison toad. These are the people that cause trouble in marriages and in churches and in companies and in schools and in hospitals. They're the people who have an inflated view of their importance and they take it out on the people they live with or who work for them. Jesus noticed this pattern and he offers some good wisdom for us. Now, this message was not addressed originally to Jesus' disciples. This is one of those rare occasions where it seems as if his message is everybody. Follow along in Luke 14, verse 7. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 because that's the context, and you'll see why Luke attached the story of a wedding banquet or the instructions about a wedding banquet right next to the healing of the man with dropsy. It's a perfect fit. It came to pass on one Sabbath, chapter 14, verse 1, when Jesus was having dinner at the house of a prominent Pharisee, a top dog, that they, that's other Pharisees and, and the legal experts, were keeping their eyes on him. They were spying him. And then a man who had dropsy, Edema, suddenly showed up. He's a plant. Real quickly, dropsy is a problem when your body retains way too much water and you swell up. You get elephant legs and elephant arms. Your extremities just puff right up, puff up, and it's grotesque. It looks awful. So they put this man in here as a plant on Sabbath, hoping that Jesus is going to bite and he's going to fall into this trap and they're ready to accuse him. And Jesus addressed the legal experts and the Pharisees and asked the question, is it lawful? Remember, they're the law guys. They ought to know the law. Is it lawful or is it permitted, that is, by the law of Moses, to heal on the Sabbath day or not? That's a perfectly legitimate question. He knows what's going on. He knows that this man is a plan. And he knows that what he's about to do is going to be like a fist right into their knows. He knows that. That what he's going to do is going to offend them. And he does it anyhow. He just slugs them right in the teeth. They were silent. So he took the man. He healed him. And sent him on his way. That shows us that the man was not an invited guest to the dinner. It was a plan. And then he said to them, this is what needs to happen to religious leaders. This is what happens, this is what needs to happen to church leaders across the world, across the city, and across the country. We need men and women who are prophetic and who are prophets, who stick the truth right into their face. And he says, suppose your son and your ox falls down into a well. Would any of you, you as a group, you as religious leaders, you who are these top dogs, you who are on stage, you who are well known, would any of you hesitate for a second to rescue your ox or your son? And they have no strength to answer. Their religion is all about themselves. Their religion is convenient as long as the rules don't apply to them. But then, when their son falls into the well, wow, watch them jump into that well, break their own law. How convenient to find loopholes. <laughs> I love Jesus' prophetic way. And this rarely happens today, does it? No one is courageous enough to call a spade a spade except Jesus. He then told a parable for the guests. Who are the guests? Who are the guests? It's these leaders, these legal experts and the Pharisees. They are, we would say today, the church's leaders, the denominational leaders. 
They're the people who are in positions of power and prominence. And he noticed something about them at the dinner. He said he noticed how they were selecting the places of honor. As we mentioned a moment ago, dinner was an opportunity to advertise your greatness. <laughs> if you were a poor guy and you were invited, you had to take a seat by the door and no one would see you. And you didn't want to sit there. But if you were cool, you had money and you had influence and you knew the guy who invited you, you got to sit next to him. And everybody would say, oh man, he is cool. She is cool. And you got to advertise your greatness. You got to show off how cool you were. He noticed this as a pattern. And do you think he showed up and said, well, maybe the problem will take care of itself. <laughs> maybe the problem will just die. You know, take the batteries out and the toy will stop. Oh, what does he do? He's not in a synagogue. He's in a person's home. And instead of being quiet, notice what he does. He said to them, that's the guests. When someone invites you to a wedding banquet, don't select the first seat. Don't select the top seat. Don't select the honorable seat. You might deserve it. Don't. Don't sit in a place where people watch you and observe you and say, man, I wish I was like her. I wish I was like him. And he is so cool and so popular. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. Life is not about showing how great we are. Life is not about advertising our talents and our gifts. Life is not about showing how cool we are. Whether you're a normal Christian, whether you're a preacher, whether you're a musician, life is not about advertising how good you are. Take, he says, the lowest place, the one that you, nobody can see. Don't take the place of honor. Here's why. In case someone more important than you has been invited, then the one who invited you will come and say to you, make room for this person. And you, what? Will be embarrassed to have to take the lowest place. As I mentioned, this passage is not delivered to the disciples. It's kind of for everybody. And I think that because of the context where Jesus has been talking about the heavenly banquet, where people will come to the door at the end of the age and knock and ask Jesus to let them into the heavenly banquet. And Jesus looks at them and says, I don't know where you're from. Think primarily, and perhaps initially, this message is evangelistic. Because the hardest thing for human beings to accept in the sight of a glorious and holy God is what? Is that we bring nothing to the table. We bring no merit to God as to why he should let us into his heavenly banquet. This is hard for people. It's hard for a rich person, a wealthy person, a celebrity to say to God, all I can bring to you are my sins. That's all I've got. That's my only price for admission. That's not a popular thing today to say. Instead, what we hear is a Christianity that is designed to puff you up and to give you that place in the sky that you want. It's so rare to hear that all have sinned. And what? I have a bone to pick with that translation. It's really not a very good one. All have sinned and fall short. Fall short is a word that's right on the boundary of that word. Primarily, it means destitute. It's the same word used to describe the prodigal son in Luke 15. All have sinned and are, are what? Destitute of the glory of God. What does destitute mean? If you're destitute, what do you have? Nothing. <laughs> you're dirt poor. You have nothing. We are destitute before God. So instead of coming to the heavenly banquet expecting to be promoted and advertised and people say how great you are, no, we, we are to take not the highest place, but the lowest place. 
In other words, when we come before God, we have to be humble. We have to acknowledge the person that we are, that we are sinners, and that we have nothing to offer God, and we depend totally on his mercy to us in Jesus Christ. That's it. So even the beginning of our Christian life depends on humility. Saying before God, your evaluation of me is true. <laughs> That's me. I'm no better than a sinner. Saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. If you've not been to that place, today would be a great day for you to acknowledge that and to acknowledge it from the heart. But it's also a good, a good message for believers. It's also a good message for our journey. Not only for salvation, but for sanctification. Why? As we will talk about in just a few minutes in our application. Um, the longer we entertain overinflated views of our importance, the longer we entertain that and the more deeply rooted it becomes, we become a problem wherever we live wherever we work. Pride is the problem in almost every New Testament epistle that you read. Name the epistle. And what's the problem involved in? It's division and arguing and fighting and quarreling over some issue. Romans, it's a problem of Jewish people thinking they're too cool for Gentiles. First Corinthians, first four chapters are devoted to what? Carry the problem of division. So I'm with Paul. I'm with Peter. I'm with Paulus. He spends four chapters trying to heal the divisions all caused by what? Pride. Galatians, problem of pride. Ephesians, problem of pride between Jew and Gentile. Philippians, I tell you, Philippians is all about people who have an inflated view of their importance. These are believers. <laughs> and Paul writes these epistles. So almost every epistle what do you have? You have Christians who, what, are just puffed up with a gas of self-importance. And they're the ones who cause problems in marriages, in families, in churches, in companies, because they all think, I deserve better than I have. They're easily angered. They're easily frustrated. They think they need to be the hero in every situation. And if you don't coddle them and baby them, they always want to quit and they always want to you find this everywhere. There's ways of creating people like that. Spoil your child. <laughs> Spoil your child. Don't let him face the consequences of his behavior, and you will produce that kind of person. Put a mirror in every room for your daughter so that every time your daughter walks by, she can admire herself in the mirror. Take the mirrors down. Throw them away. <laughs> it's a human problem. Jesus noticed it then still a problem today. We'll talk about what we can do, though, to overcome that problem and how to cultivate humility. We will in just a minute. But Jesus is addressing a problem which he sees then and appeared at the banquet halls. Uh, something came to mind as I was preparing this some time ago. <clears throat> I read the autobiography, uh, the personal memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. When he won the Battle of Chattanooga in the Civil War in November of 1863, significant battle, and he was the only general who actually won anything up to that time, President Lincoln realized that here was this unknown guy from Illinois, this unknown guy who was winning battles out in the West, and none of his generals in the East were doing anything. Even though they had more men, more money, more troops, more ammunition, they just were full of themselves and excuses. So he promoted General Grant, this little cigar-smoking short guy, and he promoted him to be a general-in-chief of the whole Union Army. And he gave him three stars. That had never been done before since General Washington and the Revolutionary War. So Grant went to Washington, met with the president and became chief of all the armies. But there was a problem. There was a general who was in charge of the Army of the Potomac. The Union armies always called their armies after rivers. The Army of the Potomac River, the Army of the Ohio River, the Army of 
the Tennessee River, the Army of the Cumberland River. And so General George Meade was in charge of the Army of the Potomac. So when Grant went to visit Meade, immediately after visiting the President, Meade said to him, I want you to choose whoever you want to be in charge of the Army of the Potomac. This war is too important, and this position is too important for a guy like me to stand in your way. Please do not avoid replacing me. Grant was impressed. In fact, Grant wrote in his memoirs that while he was impressed because Meade had won the Battle of Gettysburg, he said, I was so impressed by the humility of Meade, seeing that the Civil War and the victory of the Civil War was more important than him occupying that position. And so he kept it. And they worked well together for the remainder of the war. And he was more impressed by that conversation because it came from Meade's heart. Now Jesus gives us an alternative. He is saying, first of all, that when we overestimate ourselves and promote ourselves and try to advertise how cool we are, one day we will be demoted, either today or in glory. He goes on to say, as information that will help us, instead, he says in verse 10, follow along if you're able, instead, but... When you're invited, when you're invited to the dinner, go take the lowest spot, right by the door where no one can see you. So, when the one who invited you, the host, comes, he'll say to you, friend, come up higher. And then what will, be, then what will happen? You will be honored in front of all those reclining around the table with you. Here in verse 11 is the conclusion and it summarizes the whole message. People who promote themselves, people who advertise themselves, people who are full of themselves and always want to be noticed, they need to be needed. They need to be the hero. They need people to be telling them how great they are all the time. Those people will be demoted. But those who demote themselves and lower themselves and stay humble, they're the ones who will be exalted. They're the ones who will be promoted. So, Jesus offers us an alternative. The way of the kingdom of God, first of all, when we're saved, is to lower ourselves before God and say, I have nothing to bring to you. It doesn't matter that I'm wealthy. It doesn't matter that my daddy and mommy were famous. It doesn't matter that I've memorized the book of the Bible. It doesn't matter. I come only as a sinner, trusting in the merits of Jesus Christ. But then in the Christian life, my job is not to show people what a great musician I am, or what a great Bible scholar I am, or what a great this, or what a great that. No, put away your life, put away your stage, put away your CDs, and take the lowest place. Go to the bottom, go to the dirty parts, and serve. And one day, God will exalt you. God will either exalt you in this life, or in the life. Some things that come to my mind, I think, that might help us by way of taking this home, taking this message home and actually using it in a way that will help our families are the following. I start off with some symptoms of, of this disease that Jesus is discussing. Practical sim symptoms in, in our own life. And I start off here because I know of no other factor that contributes more to misery and unhappiness in relationships, in homes, in families, in marriages, in a company, wherever you have people interaction, the number one factor that creates all of that is a man or a woman who is spoiled, who has a huge view of himself. He's full of himself. And I, I, I should probably back up just a minute. What happens to a man who has dropsy? They swell up with water. This is why now he addresses this problem. Why? 
because all these guests have dropsy. No, not physical disease. What are they full of? What are they full of? Themselves. Here's a dinner where people are full of themselves. I'd hate to have to go to a dinner like that, wouldn't you? Because all they can do is talk about how great they are. Did you see my bad hair? Did you read my book? Did you have my CDs? What'd you think of them? <laughs> Everybody there, full of themselves. Hard to live with people who are full of themselves. Here are some symptoms, and if this symptom strikes you, this is not an accusation. This is a way like a doctor. The doctor goes in and checks your body to see if you've got a problem. So if some of these symptoms are yours, why not maybe put the shoe on, because it fits you. For example, are you easily angry? Are you easily frustrated? Are you known to have temper tantrums? Are you impatient in your afflictions? You always say, you know, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this trouble, this affliction. I deserve better in life. Are you always frustrated? And frustrated with other people? Do you have a tongue that complains about it, criticizes a lot? Do you harbor resentments? and grudges. You have a long memory for things people did to you some years ago. You never forget them. You have a hard time forgiving people and offering true forgiveness. Do you need to be needed? Are you willing to say when you've made a, a wrong, a stupid decision at home, a selfish one, you know what, that's my fault. I did that. I don't know. This is my responsibility. Please forgive me. When you're in a discussion, do you always have to have the last word? Or do you allow the other person to bring the conclusion to the discussion? Do you feel sorry for yourself? Poor me. I deserve better. When we look at your face, does it look like you've been swallowing lemons all day? <laughs> Sucking on lemons? Or, me. or is the joy of the Lord yours? Do you see joy in your life? Uh, I've noticed that people in the same field, like say in the medical world, even in my world, the ministry world, legal world, engineers, school teachers, coaches, that people who are proud and think too highly of themselves, they can't praise other people in the same profession when they say, maybe do something significant. It's hard for them to say, hey, way to go, and to do it publicly, because they're jealous. They think nobody else is better than me. When they pray, when they pray, where is their eye? On God or on other people? They pray to impress people rather than to get in touch with God. When you work for an employer, like Absalom, the son of David, people who are proud think they can always do better than the employer. If they let me be the boss, I would do so much better. Now, that may be, but this is a perennial pattern. And if you do something wrong to them, oh man, if you wrong them, you've got to get down on your knees and beg like a scrawny dog for forgiveness. And even then, the most humble of humble of all confessions sometimes won't work because they just hold on to it. They make you beg and they make you crawl. Now, these are some symptoms of someone who's just, like Spurgeon used to say, puffed up with a gas of self-importance. I don't want to leave us hanging here. This leads us, therefore, to the second point, which is the value of cultivating Humility, the value of cultivating being a humble man and a humble woman. First of all, we want to admit that even suggesting something like this is hard and it's difficult. This is not a pill you can get down at the local pharmacy. I wish it was. I would franchise it and make millions. But the culture says, go for what belongs to you. Go for what is ours. Go for the gold. 
But to cultivate humility, God has to open our eyes to see our condition. Our own eyes to see our own condition. Who comes to your mind? Peter. Peter was a jerk. Why? Because he was like a poison toad. Even after Jesus warned him repeatedly that he would fail, Jesus, his response to Jesus, no, not me, I'm not going to fail. All these other chumps that you got around you, yep, they're going to fail. You can count on me, bro. You can count on me. It took great pain and public embarrassment for him to finally realize, yeah, I'm nothing but a jerk. And he went out and he went better. But he turned! And God used Peter greatly after that moment. But it took him three years to come to look in the mirror and say, man, I recognize that fool. That must be me. Cultivating humility is not an easy thing to do. But it's a journey that begins by recognizing ourselves and then recognizing the glory of God. When we see ourselves and the glory and majesty of God, we are like, wow, I'm not in an insight. You realize that Paul makes three statements about himself, and as he gets older, the statements go from here to here until his final statement about himself is he calls him what? Self? What? The chief of sinners, the worst of the worst. As a son of growth, when we grow in humility. Which leads me to the third point to say be patient. Be patient in cultivating humility. Don't give up. It's not, it's not easy to cultivate humility. It's hard. It's difficult. It takes years and stages, but it takes your determination to ask God for help, to help you become a, a, a humble person. If you need help, ask for help. Ask for help. Ask for someone who perhaps has gone through the process. Would you help me to become humble? And I would suggest that if you're looking for a book, uh, the passage, probably that's the greatest passage in the world, is Jesus himself. Philippians. I told you Philippians is a church divided by people who had this huge views of themselves. And so he says, make my joy complete, chapter 2, verse 1, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Don't do anything out of self-ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider other people, other men and women in your church and your family as better than yourself. And each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of other people. Your attitude, the way you think about yourself, should be the same as Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be clutched and held onto, but he stripped himself. He emptied himself. And took the nature of a slave, found in human likeness, found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even a cross death, the worst kind of death. So the very Jesus here who is encouraging us to take the low place and cultivate humility, practiced what he preached. Practiced what Finally, the good news is that humility, the grace of humility, is available to everybody. Now, not all of you can give the same amount of money. Not all of us have the same intellect, or the same IQ, or the same gifts. Not all of us have the same talents. But we all can do what? We all can cultivate the humility of Jesus. And this was not planned. It's, I don't think it's on the outline. But parenting, parenting, to produce humble kids? No, it's not a guarantee, of course. It's certainly not a guarantee. But first of all, ensure that your children take responsibilities for their failures, their mistakes. They're human just like you. Make sure that they face those consequences, whether it's in school. If he or she acts up at school, don't blame the teacher. Don't blame the principal. Don't blame the coach. If they didn't show up to practice, it's their fault. Make them face their responsibilities, not in a vicious way, not in a harsh way, but it helps them develop a proper view of the 
themselves when they have to face the consequences of their failures and mistakes. And then let the kids see your habit of taking responsibility. Let your kids see you when you are wrong and scream and shout and say unkind things and have a temper tantrum. Let them see you get in front of them and bow down and confess your sins to them and acknowledge your failure in front of them. I've asked this of people. How many of you had parents who did that? I mean, it's slim pickings. But every Christian family ought to be doing this on a regular basis for any credibility. You have no credibility as a parent if you don't admit you're wrong. You have not. Stop preaching the gospel. Your kids don't want to hear you. And they shouldn't. They need to have somebody who's credible to admit and to ask forgiveness for humility. Maybe these, th these thoughts are like little matches that will start a discussion sometime this week with you and your spouse, if you have a spouse. And if you are dating, you're looking for someone to marry, you might consider this as an important trait for a person to be able to admit. Because humble people are much better to live with. <laughs> you make much better parents and much better wives and husbands and servants of Jesus. Because after all, he was our leader. He is our leader. And he's humble. And he has every reason to be proud. So Jesus is telling us that we have this desire to elevate ourselves. And Jesus said, no. Demote yourselves. And God one day will do the elevating. Let God do the one who lifts you up. And I tell you what, he'll do a better job than we do. Well, when Tommy Lawrence served as an envoy with the British Army in the Middle East, war broke out. World War I. 1914. He happened to be living in Arabia and had learned to speak Arabic and had become so close to the Arabs that they put him in charge of their armies as a representative of the British armies. And he led the army in victory over the Ottoman Empire, which had had a stranglehold over the whole.